This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. Let me start this episode with an apology. I just wasted 30 minutes of your time because I was recording you right here on my laptop without noticing that the battery, the laptop, was unplugged. Well, I'm just talking to you. We have a great conversation about everything related to astronomy, and then poof, laptop crashes. So this episode begins with humility. <laughs> Welcome to the IT world. So yes. everything happens is not as you expect. So 320 episodes. And I didn't notice that <laughs> the laptop was not plugged in. So, apology out of the way. Uh, number two, you're a gentleman. You let me visit you less than two days before you're traveling. And we'll get into where you're traveling and maybe why you travel to certain destinations. Um, you let me into your home. This is the second time we met. The first time we met was during the euphoria and a bit of chaos in the weeks past October 17. And now I'm in your home, in the mountains. Also that you're willing to talk about something that's unrelated to Lebanese politics. And it's something I've been wanting to discuss for a long time with someone who's very fluent in the world of astronomy. And it all lined up perfectly. So the laptop is plugged in. The microphones are working. Maroon. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you this won't happen again. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see exactly. <laughs> Let's see in 30 minutes. Yes. <laughs> Let me start by asking you a very simple question. Why are you into astronomy? And I'm not, I mean, for me, it's an amateur hobby. It's something I use to escape a bit from the world. Um, I know, I think, superficial level of, uh, of astronomy in general but you're very passionate about it. And I think um, it's not an easy subject maybe to learn about. Uh, there is some, maybe you need some infrastructure if you really want to pursue it properly. And I don't think it's an easy task, but once you're in it, I think it's, I can only imagine it being a wonderful experience. But what took you to the world of astronomy? And uh, what keeps you in it, even when it's not your day job? Because I know that you're a cybersecurity expert and you're astronomy or you're maybe an astrophotographer by night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as much as you can say about what brought you to this world and why you find meaning in it. Yes, I don't know where to start. First of all, I would like to thank you for hosting me. It's like it's a pleasure and uh, knowing that all those... Uh, famous people that you interview from from an episode to another so it's a uh, it's an honor to me to be part of those uh, your podcast it's a build up to you mother <laughs> yeah i finally <laughs> meet someone that looks a little bit like me that dresses like me <laughs> that that in a way thinks in a way like me so this is for me i've reached I'm getting higher and higher in the mountain. <laughs> yeah, please stop <laughs> boosting my egos. Like okay, it should yeah. remain. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking. But <laughs> after yeah, this, it's free fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so just to speak about astronomy, if you see my, it's very hard sometimes to make a description about mm -hmm. yourself. So it's like you just did a small introduction, which is usually very hard for me to do, to make. Mm. But uh, if I had one description on my social media handle, it's like cybersecurity specialist by day, astrophotographer by night. Okay. So uh, <laughs> to answer your question, uh, true that it started as a hobby disregarding about the path to reach the current situation, but it's like uh, this hobby feeds my professional life and vice versa. It's mm. like after all this... Uh, mind fuck let's say during the day yeah. and you need to rest your brain so mm. it's like 
I release and I escape through astronomy at night so that I have the energy to work during the day. And on the yeah. other hand, it's like it's my daily job that helps me just to buy those telescopes in order to enjoy my life. So, right. so I, it might appear like a pyramid scheme, yes. <laughs> but it's not the case. So, uh, so it's a personal uh, it's a personal pyramid scheme in a way that okay. you're investing your earnings on your passion. That's quite lovely. I, I want to tell you a bit about my own journey, and maybe I can learn from you if it relates. Um, my youngest curiosity, let's say in my mind, is astronomer-related. Uh, thinking of myself as a child on my sofa, jumping from the sofa to the floor, trying to imagine what it would be like with less gravity. Okay. And I mean, I'm a stupid kid trying to l mimic what I'm seeing on TV. And on TV, it's either the space shuttle program. Uh, this is going back to maybe the mid-80s when it was on the news quite frequently, not necessarily for good reasons only. This is when the Challenger uh, blew up. I was in the U.S. at the time. There was so much concentration and effort. And I was a student at school, and we were all watching this rocket ship blow up. But it didn't dampen the curiosity. It actually did, had nothing to do with it. Curiosity was there. Uh, Carl Sagan was, for me, at, late at night. My parents are asleep on the sofa. I'm sitting with them. And there's talk shows with him. Um, growing up, it's maybe a bit of emotional uh, uh, pain when Pluto is <laughs> kicked off the solar system <laughs> list. Suddenly we have eight planets rather than nine. And I know Pluto should mean nothing to me. Yet... I think I was really sad about Pluto, this distant dwarf planet that I'll never okay. know, never see. But once you have photos of it, and once you're curious about it, it becomes personal. Then learning about other storytellers in astronomy, whether it's Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I think pulled in a lot of people into the curiosity. Again, it's a thin level, but it's, it's there. And... Even myself, and I do this regularly on YouTube at night, I will watch these, I don't know if they're almost, um, it's these odd channels that will have Voyage into Space. It's not National Geographic or History Channel or anything like that. These are sometimes independent stations. And suddenly I'm curious about life on Europa, whether or not okay. Jupiter's moons have life beneath an icy surface. Um, I learn about Planet Nine, this mystery beyond Neptune, uh, perhaps a giant gas planet. And suddenly I'm friends on Facebook with an astronomer, Konstantin Batigov or Batigin, I forgot his last name. So I'm, I'm at night, I'm escaping Lebanese politics and I'm going into astronomy. And I'm wondering, is it for you a healing where you're trying to disconnect from the the grind, the daily grind, and you're rebooting. Of course, your rebooting is far bigger, and you have a telescope, a, a prof professional level tel telescope, um, and you spend your money on it. I don't spend my money on it, but is it that kind of? You're letting the, you're correcting the day by, in a way, worshiping the night. <laughs> wow, that, I did not expect to reach this conclusion in a question, but I'm I'm gonna start from the beginning. So when you are talking about testing the zero gravity when mm. you're doing and you said you called yourself stupid no it's not stupid that's okay, first good. of all <laughs> uh, the first thing about it it's like it's not always about having the right question the, the right answers it's about knowing how to ask the right questions and mm. this is what made science and the human knowledge to evolve with time yeah and proceeding with this regarding Carl, Carl Sagan and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and all this process they have also played a great role in uh, making science accessible to everyone, to within right. everyone's reach and all this stuff, and make people question the right, and ask the right questions. Mm. So um, uh, looking back into the Carl Sagan days, I was a child back in, uh, I, I don't remember them very well, I just watched them in old videos to yes, Carl Sagan, right. so I don't remember. But he has touched lots of, uh, he has borne lots of other topics that has never bordered astronomy, for example, mm. he has touched mm politics, psychology, and the way, this humble way of delivering the message 
was so amazing that it's really humbling, especially when we need to compare it to to Carl Say, uh, to Neil deGrasse. Tyson. I'm not, I don't, yeah. I'm not yeah, yeah. entitled to compare them, but if you look at Carl Sagan, it's very humbling. It's like I need to listen more to him. You you st you say the same about Neil deGrasse. I need to listen more, but it comes with, uh, uh, let's say. Uh, Tariqa Muta'ali, or let's say kind of, uh, what do you say in English? Uh, wow, I don't a know. It's a little bit more arrogant, let's say. Yeah, if yeah. The way he, both of them deliver the right amount of knowledge, and they exactly. know how to deliver the message. And Neil deGrasse Tyson applied to the university where Carl Sagan was teaching. Okay. And he got accepted. And I think that's that's a real story where, he yeah, says, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's, they, mm. they even... They have their own relationship. Yes. Yeah. So speaking of which, regarding astronomy and stuff, and especially that it's not integrated into the school programs, right. I know some organizations who have been looking for grants recently in order to have some kind of training for the trainers, for the teachers, let's say, on how to say uh, to give some courses and to mm -hmm. deliver the astronomy message to students. So it has been, it hasn't been in the program. So even when I was a child and. Do, taking some courses at school. I don't remember any time that astronomy was mentioned. And back to the Pluto when he was kicked out and uh, <laughs> the stuff. So uh, I kind of look at it from a kind of those people who scientifically pushed out Pluto, let's say, because there was it pushed uh, the astronomy, let's say, community to redefine what is a planet in order to push Pluto out. So it was pushed for a reason. Uh, and that's not something we hear every day because yeah. every time we need to say that Pluto is not a planet because it does not uh, abide to those three low rules that's, that define a planet. But it was kicked out because if Pluto was still considered a planet, there would have been 14 or 400,000 right. other planets yeah. beyond those ones that we have been raised as kids as right. this Jupiter is our friend, or let's say Saturn has rings. It's yeah, very yeah. cute and stuff. And Pluto is a far away. So, yes. so it's part of the stories, just like all those stories they used to tell us before we sleep. So mm. that's why you all had this emotional attachment to Pluto that until now that many people are refusing of having it demoted as a status of a planet. Okay, they call it as a dwarf planet, but yeah, but somebody will say maybe a dwarf planet can be, why wouldn't it be considered as a planet too? No, it's not. So it's like, it has some kind of politics. I'm not gonna say politics, but it was smartly put by Mike Brown and his mm -hmm. colleague you just mentioned because they did not even demote Pluto when they were suggesting it's Mike Brown and, uh, and his colleague was considered that the people who killed Pluto. Actually, he has a, he has a book, How I Killed Pluto or Why really? I Killed Pluto or something like this. He's known to be the person who killed Pluto. You know, it's, but this, this uh, way of bridging science with storytelling, which I think is really what astronomy is for an amateur. Um, for me, it's a story and it's a fascinating story because it doesn't, it's not just about the neighboring planets or whether or not Pluto is one of dozens, if not hundreds of dwarf planets. It's not that. It's, this is the starting point of understanding everything. And astronomy is all of the above. And I like that you already, you hinted at even, even politics becomes part of the story, but it's, it's all of the above and it's also healing at the same time. And there's some beauty there, I think. And I, I find myself looking back to student days, mostly in the U.S., you'd be looking in a planetarium. We'd be taken on a school trip to a planetarium, gazing at the night sky during the day, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the Milky Way. And I'm maybe seven or eight years old, so it's not like this is real. It's for kids, but it's fascinating. And I'm wondering if you experienced the same thing where you grew up. You're in Del Amar. You have a lovely view in this part of Lebanon, it's, uninter it's uninterrupted. It's dark enough where you can actually see enough of the night sky. Did that enable your curiosity, which made it later into something more serious? But is there an innocence there of just looking up and wondering what this is all about? 
Yes, uh, speaking of uh, the dark enough, let's say it has become dark oh. enough recently due <laughs> yes. to the uh, the unfortunate uh, situation of not having electricity, mm. especially during the night. Uh, I'm going to dive into the light pollution topic in a while. And uh, speaking of the, the observatory that you mentioned that we're going to have a trip and yes. visit it in a while, uh, through that, originally it was built for astrophotography. Mm. But uh, it has been doing some science recently. So uh, I'm participating in several research groups, for example, for collecting data within the capabilities of my, let's say, relatively extremely small size of a telescope comparing to the large observatories that mm -hmm. are in the million and billions of dollars. It's better than my night sky application. Uh, <laughs> as far as I know, if I do the comparison, yes, it's better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, because whenever we compare telescope, it's about the diameter of yes. the light. So, it's, right. this, mine is 20 inches, 8 inches. This one is around 0 0.5 inches. That's and so, five. definitely, scientifically speaking, it's better than more. So <laughs> it's better than in mobile. Scientifically speaking, size matters when it comes to yes, telescopes. Uh, it's, <laughs> yes, let, let's say it's not about how long it is. It's right. about how the how, diameter also. I think a lot of women have said the same thing. Um, <laughs> Look, it depends. I'm not. I'm sure that this is what I like about astronomy because yeah. it can border lots of other topics. There so. you go. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, scientifically speaking, scientifically speaking, yeah, and yeah. we're not relying on statistics in here. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. determined that the larger the diameter of a telescope, and it, it will be, it will get more details, and will mm -hmm. get even, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let's say more details about the light that we are receiving, more light, and uh, it will uh, mm -hmm. increase the light gathering capabilities, and more details and sharper, of course, depending on the capabilities. Mm -hmm. So speaking of uh, light, through that Lebanon has been still undergoing the bad situation when it comes to light pollution, there are several, uh, a few, a bunch of people that are, let's say, benefiting from it, which are astrophotographers mm. currently. Mm. That does not mean that they are happy with it, but they are at least what I see that through that people are diving into the solar panel and the alternative sources of power. So they have learned how to not uh, to use, but not abuse electricity and to leave it, for example, lit during the night. 75% of all the light pollution across the world comes from street lights, right. which is currently, since it's not needed during the night, currently they are being turned off. Same for the applies for the light that we have in front of our doors that are always on. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. are turned off during the night. So, uh, so people are knowing how to, uh, let's say, uh, use uh, light, let's say, in an optimized way mm. as much as they need. There are several countries where they have light pollution policies. So let's first dis define light pollution, because I don't remember any time that I did, did an astronomy talk where light pollution had this major 30 percent at least of the talk. Sometimes some a presentation was about 100% about light pollution. Mm. So light pollution is about, why do we call it pollution at the beginning? Pollution is because we are adding it to a certain environment and it's uh, adding some negative repercussions to the environment. Right. So light affects the human, affects the trees, affects the animals. Um, I'm not sure, when I used to be a kid, for example, in this house, when my mother used to give me some studies before the second day and stuff in here, it was actually on that window in here. We used to see some fireflies passing by. Oh, I'm not yeah. sure when was the last time you've seen a firefly. That's a good point, so, yeah. So, uh, oh, it's been so long. Fireflies do communicate by blinking to each other, male and mm, the female. Mm. So uh, whenever there's a strong light, they will not be able to see the blinking. Of it. Therefore, they will not be able to reproduce and they will be uh, regressively extinct from the places where light has been increasing. So they have been concentrated in the deep, dark, places of the forest mm. and which are actually light has been trespassing trespassing towards this area. So light has been being abused, used and abused uh, in an extreme way and that it has been reaching to the ecosystems of the of those animals, even that humans are not living there. So, so, th so even in Deir al-Amr, for example, you've, you've seen an increase in that kind of night, uh, light pollution, even in a fairly small uh, town. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, there is this direct correlation between the number of people who are living in an area and light. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's number one. And yes, light has been increasing everywhere in the world. There mm -hmm. are some uh, worldwide organizations, for example, the International Dark Sky Association, 
which are uh, that taking... sounds like a Star Wars uh, yeah, council. but they, they <laughs> are kind of thing. doing this outreach <laughs> about uh, the negative effects of mm. uh, of light or yeah. abusing light. So uh, that's part of them. I'm just talking about a very small part regarding uh, the the yeah. um, the fireflies. That's one mm. of them. Yeah, the Siraj al Lail in Arabic. In case many people, it took me a while actually to make the kind of Siraj al Lail and firefly. <laughs> uh, and you know, when it comes to the food chain, when one species disappeared, it's right. like yeah, yeah. it's gonna affect the food chain. Right. Uh, the other part when it comes to the animals, uh, many times we see those um, foxes or uh, yes. uh, what do we call them? Uh, uh, hyenas. The sh- chakal? Uh, Ch- chakal. Yeah, chakal. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we never see it on a road where it has light. We always see it when right. either the light is off yes. or whenever there is no light. Mm. So most of the animals are adapted to sleep. There are some animals who f- uh, ha- hunt at night. Hunt? Uh, hunt, yeah, hunt yeah, at yeah, night, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but uh, but some animals are made to sleep during the night, for example. Mm. So uh, and those animals escape the light, and yeah. we are actually kicking them away from their natural habitat. Speaking of humans, uh, there are, for example, uh, I'm going to give a small example. If you want to read on your mobile at night, there's some, a setting called the reading mode or yes. night mode. Or uh, yeah, Transform yeah. your screen to red. Right. It's not actually transforming to red. It's deactivating the blue shade of the screen. Mm, mm. Because the blue shade, uh, it actually g- uh, puts your brain on alert that this is daylight oh, and back yeah. to the hunters and gather it's before the, during the evolution days that yeah. we are actually, it's time to wake up and hunt and, or be awake and hunt. So that part, that's part of spectrum that also comes from the sun during the day. This is actually what puts our brain on alert. So that mm. red blue shade that exists and all the red lights, because red is full spectrum from right. blue to from blue to red, uh, it's not supposed to be put uh, between uh, residential areas. It can, it's better to be put mm. on highways mm. to mm. keep people awake. Yes. But for example, if you're coming back at night, uh, you are as kind of sleepy, and suddenly. You put on your LED light within your room, and suddenly you you, you are you you are unable to sleep. Right. I, I, I so you, so you I mean you, it's a very sophisticated take on how light pollution is not just about not seeing correct. space; it's also interfering with sleep patterns the, and, and an environment. And speaking to art, in order to apply this into yes. astronomy, mm. it's like if we want to compare light pollution and astronomy to something else, for example, consider yourself you're in a coffee shop and you're talking, yeah. you're talking to each other in a coffee shop. If there was this high background noise, we cannot hear each other clearly, but you can raise your voice in order to hear me. So the same applies when it comes right. to the light. So you've got yeah. the light coming, the dim light coming from the stars, and you've got this environmental light coming from the street light. So you will not be able to differentiate the stars and the astronomical objects mm-hmm. from, uh, from the background. The only difference is that when you're in a coffee shop, you can raise your voice, but actually the stars and the astronomical objects cannot do it. So that's why <laughs> that's light true. pollution limits it with no return. So, so, so currently we have an opportunity in Lebanon that yeah. when I sense that we have the lights that are, because it's usually much easier to turn on light and install new light bulbs than turning them off. So currently that since that's the statico that has turned off some lights, especially the lights that are not used, it's only turning back on the lights that are specifically needed, which I consider it's an opportunity to start to manage the light uh, in a better way. And most, to add to add to it, it's going to be energy efficient. So we're not going to be spending energy and fuel, fossil fuel, whatever was the source, even that was solar panel during the day, you can use it for something else within the house. You know, you, you found a way, constructive way, of linking this field with politics. And I think that is actually something for anyone with an environmental background. Somebody, I, I mean, I think the name you, in a way we mentioned it already before recording, but somebody like Najat on Sadiba, who has that built-in curiosity, or even the MPs that were trying, the the, the candidates, Ziad Abishakir is somebody mm. I think who would probably be interested in something like this. I think there is space now to talk about these things constructively at least when it comes to energy and the advantage of not having so much light pollution, but the disadvantage of not talking about why this could be construed in a better way once electricity does return. So I like the energy management aspect, but allow me, allow me to go back Mm. in time just a bit again. Are you somebody who's naturally drawn to just looking up at night and trying to find your place in the universe? Because... 
for me. Something very healthy about growing up with that built-in curiosity, which is I appreciate how insignificant we are. <laughs> I understand that the Big Bang is something that you can think about, you can imagine, but you'll never fully grasp it. And the fact that we still don't know if time and space even exists prior to that, it means really we're <coughs> probably as negligible as you can imagine. We're in a very short period of time on this planet, let alone the universe. And it, it humbles, I think, a lot of our problems. It puts everything in perspective, at least momentarily. Correct. Yeah, does that happen to you when you're, I mean, the thought that there are <laughs> at least millions, if not more, stars in our galaxy alone, and that there are hundreds of millions of galaxies, if not more, in the universe, and that each star has its own, perhaps, potential solar system, you're looking at an endless number of things that are like this planet, and yeah, so far we haven't found life elsewhere, but it's still, if, if it's put into that spectrum, the complications on day-to-day -day life seem not even worth talking about. So I'm not trying to be hard on our day-to-day -day problems, but I'm also trying to think if this resonates, that you're, this in a way just comforts, in a, in a, in a, in a very, okay. I don't know how to say it, it's not a scientific way. Yeah, it's, it's I, a, I know how to, yeah. uh, let's say, to put it in words from yeah. my perspective. First of all, I want to say that it's just a hobby, just like any other person enjoying any other hobby. Just, mm. It's just mm. like a regular hobby. Yeah. Anybody can become very extremely passionate about ping pong, for example. Yeah, and true. and so many right. people can, can yeah. be much more passionate than me in ping pong, for yeah. example. So it's just an escape. So it's just an escape, a hobby. Mm. Mm. And that's very hard to find a hobby. So I have tried several hobbies. I have dealt with them for several years. And this time you just outgrow them. Just yeah. like, for example, I might outgrow, outgrow this current hobby and might find something that might interest me more at a later stage. Uh, I doubt it, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I also doubt it, but it's like uh, everything, you never know. It's like my mindset yeah. six months ago is different than what it is right now. That's true. Yeah. So, uh, and when it comes to astronomy, it's like I'm introvert by, I, I have always been introvert for the, for all of my, let's say, time, let's <laughs> okay, say. Yeah. So it, uh, it goes hand in hand with this hobby, which can be uh, done uh, individually. So you don't yeah. need a, yeah. a player to, uh, to be able to, right. another player to, in order to play it, to, to, uh, to apply it for it. So it's just any, a hobby, just like mm. any mm. other person who has a hobby. Um, but could you take, could you describe maybe a bit more about whether or not you find your place in this story by just looking up. Because I do that naturally. And I like that we're in the mountains tonight. It's easier to do that. I will see the Big Dipper. I'll always guess where Jupiter is or Mars. I think I always figure out Venus. These things, I think, I have night sky, so I do make sure I see them. And it turns out 90% of the time, they're what I think they are. Um, and I feel silly, but then this brings me joy. Now, on a professional level, what is the feeling you have when you're actually stargazing with a with a real telescope, and you're doing you're spending hours doing this, and you've actually you've made a name for yourself. And I I hope I got this right that even NASA picked up some of your photos. So this is not just hobby, and this is more than that. What what are the feelings you're you're feeling when you're doing that alone? in your observatory. Okay. Uh, my first comment is like, I had a smile when you were telling that the Big Dipper is there and Venus is there. It's yeah. actually the Big Dipper. This is north and this is the direction of the Big Dipper. Oh. Even that it's the first time within the house. It's not bad, huh? So yeah, <laughs> that's the first thing. Hey, so. all right. <laughs> so it's behind those three walls, there's the Big Dipper currently there. You know, but that, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yes. Second part, it's like, uh, speaking of that, as, uh, the astrophotography and the astronomy has been a therapy for me. It's like I find it like it's um, how to put it in words. It's the type of loyal hobbies that the more you give it, the more and it returns when it comes to the mental reward. It's like 
take this cookie before you sleep. Yeah, uh, right. So that's right. the second part about it. And uh, the third part you were just um, talking about, yes, uh, regarding stargazing, let's say, yeah. uh, because stargazing by itself, it's like a kind of, uh, let's call it, it's a commercial name for, mm, mm. for being under the stars. Yeah. So sometimes, okay, true that you are stargazing, you can be roof gazing right now, but that's not the case. <laughs> you can be stargazing, you yeah. are looking at all those identical mm, mm. dots, yeah. colorful dots in the sky. Uh, but many times that it's not about the stars, it's about your state of mind when you are under the stars. When you right. mentioned it's humbling, that's correct. Because when we are under the stars, especially if we were a group, it's like we don't have this shield that we have built during the day. It's like we are dealing with, uh, with each other in a very humbling way. Sometimes I meet lots of people that I have never been seen their face during the day. I don't know how they look like during the day. Mm. And, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's recurrent and that's also mutual to many people. It's yeah. like uh, we, I meet some people during the night, they meet me and just the next time we see each other during the day, we don't recognize each other. So so for, for stargazing? For yeah, the, let's, for uh, let's say, for example, whenever I go to those events, to yes, yeah. my friends are organizing an mm -hmm. event or stuff because I usually avoid large gatherings yeah. uh, when it comes to astronomy. So it's like it's very humbling and it's not only about the stars themselves because the stars themselves and the stargazing is commercial slash uh, commercial dash romantic, not commercial right, slash romantic right. alone. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but <laughs> but it's a great feeling. For yeah. example, if I want to say, uh, if you put me under dark sky, each time this feeling intensifies. If you, uh, after going to see the aurora for three times of my life, it's like I said, okay, I'm bored of the aurora. When I went to see them the first time, I said, wow, the feeling was more intense than the one before. It. Of course, oh. if you're going to do it every day, you're going to get used to it. But it's like, for me, uh, the breakthrough is not only about what I'm seeing. It's about uh, results, uh, pushing the results to the limits of my equipment in order to get better images and how to extract more information from the data that I'm gathering. Right. So, uh, for example, I started to feel a little bit bored out of astrophotography, so I started contributing to several science projects, for example, uh, several citizen science and even scientific uh, programs that people are doing some research. Um, uh, so, let if we need to put it in a nutshell, so what, how is the telescope used? So, the telescope is like a certain objective that is, uh, getting you more details of the objects that you are observing, was it a star, yeah. a galaxy, or anything. So you can either put a camera, because we do not do the observational just with the eye anymore, because right. the cameras are more sensitive than our eyes. We can take very extremely long exposures to mm. get the details, something mm -hmm. impossible to get with our biological mm -hmm. eyes. So you can either put a camera and record this data and analyze this data at a later stage. And there's another device that you can put a telescope, which I recently purchased and I'm being experimenting with for a while. It's a spectroscope. So it's like... I've heard this word before. So it's just like it's, uh, you are analyzing, you're not analyzing uh, the intensity of light anymore, just like the camera alone does. Right. So it just spreads the light just like the rainbow. And you analyze the mm. ratio and the type of spectra you are receiving. So, so that's, is that to identify certain locations? In other words... Um, like a gas giant yeah, versus uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. for example, a spectroscope or spectrograph is what makes astronomy to become astrophysics. Right. So this right. is where you can apply because in the end, astrophysics is about astron. Uh, it's like physics. All the equations that we have learned and evolved all mm. this time simply applied to space, but right. we can't reach. So the only the other difference is that you don't have a, this controlled lab like you have when you're doing an experiment. Right. You only have yeah, yeah, yeah. that space that you cannot control. You're simply observing and drawing conclusion based on the equations that you have evolved in physics on right. Earth for all this time. So on, on a more advanced level, mm. very advanced and almost like mm. a collective effort, is that the kind of technology used to uh, image the black hole? that was uh, produced? It's, it's different, it's different. Oh. Uh, the black hole, it's like, uh, I also have some uh, comments on this. 
when it comes, if we call the, we did not image the black hole. We yeah, image I mean, it's surrounding the right. one that that is not black. Everything that is black. Sorry, yes, yeah. exactly. But is that spectro? Um, sorry, the word yeah, that, again. That uh, was taken in a different uh, wavelength. Oh, different. So okay. it's not. Uh, yeah. So it was taken with uh, with red with telescopes that are part of uh, let's say ally alliance, a big chain of telescopes. So I and see. they use the interferometry. Uh, the main okay. the technique that was used right so so it's not the same but it's but it's that kind of uh i mean is that what you're talking about on a far advanced level that mm. you're able to decipher rather than just look out okay because my my understanding of telescopes is the most primitive understanding and, and a telescope is primitive it's by the way yeah, by it's itself it's, it's simply just like if we need to compare a telescope to uh this uh uh, magnifier. Yeah, exactly. So the sun rays during the day do not burn the uh, the, uh, the 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 trees' leaves when they are on the ground. But whenever right. you put uh, this uh, yeah a magnifier this magnifier yes. and you focus this point, it's like all the light coming to this diameter and the area of the magnifier. It's focused on one point, and right. therefore you've got more energy and a less and a more condensed area and a smaller right. area, and therefore it gives it the ability to burn the same. So, so the telescope does the same. Right, but it's no longer us looking through the lens. It's what you said, I yes. think, which is we don't, we can't do so that. So you're improving yeah. what the eye can see. Right. Yeah, so yeah. for a very dim object, you just, the larger the telescope is, the one yeah. it comes to diameter, uh, the more details when it comes to the light and the resolution and details you will be receiving. And right, whenever right. you plug in the camera, instead of putting the eyes, you will be able to record more details, longer details, and at least you will actually quantify them in a way to be able to share them with other astronomers and to compare the right. result. To, uh, so it's not individual anymore. You, whenever you share your data, actually, mm -hmm. they will be able to be processed in an objective way, scientific way, not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, emotional way, depending on your mood. OK, my mood is good today. So, ha, this star was <laughs> bright. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's so but let me let me let me understand something. You're, you're very advanced in your knowledge and your appreciation of astrophysics uh, this is not something that is easy to pursue anywhere and I don't think Lebanon is I mean the the only observatory I've seen is the one at AUB which is not in use um, we mentioned when we weren't recording that there may be one in in Baalba because no not not in Baalba. And towards the Baka but, the but it was yeah. uh, it was one of the earliest but I guess it's mm. in uh, uh, Ksara, if I'm not mistaken, okay. for the Jesuit. I always have this mistake. Is there Ksara or Kefraya and the wine? It's like I always confuse them together, but one of those uh, couvent. Okay, so, but it's uh, probably not in use. No, it's actually, it's currently, it has been, tra the dome has been transformed uh, to a house and the telescope is not there oh. anymore. Okay, so, so the Lee Observatory of AUB is yeah. one of the oldest and currently it's one of the most light polluted areas in Lebanon. So right. you cannot actually make use of it a lot comparing to the, if you see the photos of AUB um, and then early 90s, for example, it's, uh, it's, yeah. um, it was much, much, it, I guess it was built AUB in 1913, 1914, if, if we see the dates on the yeah. buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, Beirut was totally, Beirut was actually like several houses with some trees uh, very separated from each other. Right. And uh, so, so it was different. A different, I mean, and it obviously inferior technology compared to what's available. But it can be used by there. Are lots of stuff used. that can be done from light polluted areas. But I'm curious about you. you. You, I know from what you told me that you're doing a master's thesis in this world, astrophysics, or related to it. You're the only student in that program still, and it's shut down. But you're you're still one of the last remaining students. Unfortunately, so yeah. you're pursuing a degree in a in a field that's not really it's it doesn't exist at the moment. But you're making it happen on your terms. Uh, there's no observatory. Uh, it's a difficult task, especially when the infrastructure is not there. Uh, you're providing yourself with enough battery fluid, enough generator diesel, enough whatever double electricity exists mm -hmm. to operate machinery, and you're doing this on your own. What is that all about? I mean, am, am I? I'm trying to understand. It's not just passion. It's it's more like a commitment. It, okay. Are you? Are you trying to, in a way, steer this a bit? Are I mean, are you making this? a more pr maybe a more pronounced field for Lebanese that want to pursue it 
I mean, are, do you see mm. yourself as part of this story, or okay. is it just that you're determined, no matter what, to stargaze in a way that makes sense to you? Before graduating from school and wanted to pick a major, I always wanted to get into the astronomy and the astrophysics thing. But I was not able, I did not have the money enough. I, w- I was coming from a poor area, a poor family, let's say. We were, we were barely living back in the days. It was lots of things happening uh, at the same time. So my only chance was to enter the Lebanese University and I did engineering. And that was mm. actually... I really liked that major, but mm-hmm. after the engineering, it was like I did the cybersecurity, and uh, which is something that I have been working for several years since mm-hmm. 12 or 13 years uh, back in the days. But after coming back to Lebanon in 2018, 2019, it's like uh, this dream that I used to have when I was 18. Yeah, it sparked again. I said, if I don't do it now, it's not going to happen at a later stage. So that's part of the story. But that's not mean that I just doing it just because I wanted to achieve. Yeah, it. Like I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you that studying at the age of 35 and 34 and 36 is different than studying when you are 19 and yeah. 20. It's like uh, if I remember when I was in, the, in university and you say that it's um, Okay, you, it's 10 p.m. Okay, let's study for three, four hours. This is the best time to focus. There's not, not, not enough noise and stuff. It's like at the age of 35, you start studying at 10, 10, 15, you're already asleep. It's like your brain wants to escape the papers and start, just do something else. Yeah. So it's like my Patience brain. Patience is gone. So yeah, yeah you don't have yeah. the space. It's like, it's like playing football. It's like playing football yeah, yeah, yeah. at 18 and different than 36. Of course. So it's like you... You can play 90 minutes when you are 18. You yeah. can maybe 120 minutes, but Not it's, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to mention that it's, uh, there was a struggle to finish mm. this degree. That's a part, especially that I also work. So it's like I'm, I was exhausted every yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. And I have disappointed lots of my professors. <laughs> and some of them were actually were very happy with my outcome. But mm. so there are some courses that actually were hard for me, depending on the pressure at work. So my only comment is just to everybody who's watching this, if you've got a passion to a certain topic or a certain major, just do it as soon as possible, yeah. as soon as you can. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's like if you haven't done it yet, you can always do it, but it's much easier now, depending on the capabilities. Of course. So I know after coming up, I had the capability and I pursued it. So answering your first question, I know what the hell am I doing when there is no future for this in Lebanon here? Uh, knowing that, okay, potentially it can be, you can leave Lebanon whenever you want and stuff, which is which is which might be the case, but it's like I I don't have an answer to this, but it's like I'm happy enjoying and exploit exploit uh, exploring this unexploitable field in Lebanon. So mm. for example, uh, I would love for example if anybody somebody else join me and just do it together. And there are lots of communities. There are lots of communities for the astronomy outreach, and lots of uh, communities. Uh, some teachers who used to give this course and uh, and those universities like they are still there a few of them are still there uh, so i'm sure that if we manage to isolate politics from this thing because even universities i don't don't ever think that even the universities have those are always on good terms there's always politics you you are escaping politics and this topic but politics is everywhere. You've got yeah. the internal politics everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, but you're talking about you're talking about politics related to I'm keeping ta- this degree available, or is it more politics? No, no. Uh, I'm talking about uh, no. The degree, the degree is closed as mm. far as I know. There, there are not accepting further students. But I'm talking about the politics, like everywhere there's politics it's like everywhere there's negotiation it's right. like when, yeah, yeah. when i'm talking to you there's some kind of negotiation okay. happening around yeah, but yeah, the yeah. constructive part of negotiation right. uh, the mentality in lebanon it's like they are always destructive destructive either me or no one they mm. have they have mm. this type of mentality in here and uh, we had lots of opportunities in lebanon i'm not talking about myself about to push things further yeah. but the part of the megalomania and the politicism and the field hey it's either me or no one has been destroying it it exists in all the fields even in the most peaceful fields in Lebanon it does exist everywhere if we wanted to compare this to the European mentality in Europe for example uh, in Netherlands let's say since I have experience there they don't break the rules they bend them to make mm-hmm. things work here mm-hmm. they break the rules to make things stop <laughs> so but, you know, I, I, I mean, I, this may not be exactly the same thing, but in terms of politics interfering with or, or people do not collaborate in here. People just like I want to get the credits. I want to do this. I want everybody to know that I did this. And this is a major obstacle instead yeah. of moving things forward. 
I, I also think, and this is maybe taking it a step in a different direction, that it's quite remarkable to have met you at a moment where politics was on everyone's, I mean, it was, this is days after October 17, 2019. When we met, yeah. When we met, everyone's discussing politics, even in the location that you're giving your presentation about astrophotography, you're talking about space, you're talking about physics, and in the in Alia's bookstore in Jemaisi and outside, there's protests happening. People are talking about aspirations <laughs> of the of the protest movement, and you know, Saad Hariri, Michel Aoun, Nabih Birri. Everyone's talking about politics. Hezbollah, uh, Samir Jaja. It's all happening around us. Okay, and you're there. Almost like it's like turning off the volume on politics as much as you can to talk about something that I think is it's the thing that gets lost when politics gets too high in the conversation that there's other things that are worth talking about science education is one of them or even the pursuit of science and it pulled me in the co-host of this podcast Alia Haber in the early days she was a co-host in the early days of October 17, she, she joined and she, in a way, suggested and she made it clear that this is a missed opportunity if I don't go. It's one of the best decisions I made because I could see politics mm-hmm. happening on the streets and then I could see someone like you trying to also talk about other things. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important because if you're not doing that, I think somebody who's very passionate about astronomy, if you're not there, I don't think... These, I don't think astronomy would be as, in, I don't think it would be talked about nearly as much. I think, and that mm. could be the one benefit of someone like you sticking around, is that it still pulls in enough people to discuss it, even when the country collapses. So I think that's a very clear benefit. Yeah, just to talk about this, there are many people and organizations working this lay on the astronomy outreach, even some astrophysicists who keep giving talks. For example, we had this, uh, when when Elia was giving this uh, Café Scientifique, yes, there was another yeah. thing uh, called, uh, I, I forgot the name, but there was this weekly event. Uh, yeah. And there was this one, very similar to one that I used to attend in Leiden and the Netherlands called Astronomy on Tap. It's like everybody gathers in a pub. It's like everybody drinking. Oh, literally beer. on tap. Yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah. like, and yeah. there's a quiz night at the yeah. end after a speaker <laughs> and stuff. So so th- there used to be amazing night. And those yeah. are the things that I used to miss. And then uh, I knew that I'm going to miss mm. after coming back to mm. Lebanon. And I was happy to see them grow again. And I also participated and uh, and few of them so just to give the right words, there are many people who have, many people who have been working on the astronomy education and to push things forward in Lebanon. Back regarding this uh, turmoil of event of politics that were happening yeah. when this guy called Marun Habib who talked about the astrophotography back yes. uh, back in the days uh, i don't want to put this under in a way to dilute the mm. Astro- mm. The, the the political mm. situation that yeah. was happening but yeah. sometimes it's like you need to pause think about something else and just come back to the problem. For example, yeah. if you are solving, let's say, an IT problem or any type of problem uh, during the day after four hours of focus, sometimes it, you just take a 10 minutes break. It's like your brain is going to think without knowing. And right. after coming back from or even from this lunch break and suddenly five minutes, you solved it. Yeah. So I do consider that what I call the escape, the psychotherapist, this um, this uh, helpful environment or helpful uh, time you are spending there it's uh, it's very useful to uh, to proceed in a healthy life i'm not saying that i'm healthy when it comes to we all have our issues in lebanon actually if somebody doesn't have issues that he has that's it would be a main problem that would not be a normal human being no but i could also add to this i think the week before your talk was najat on saliba Talking really? about environmental policy, okay. and now she's an MP. Okay. So I think there's. I did not know this. Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly. It was mm. maybe late October. Okay. She was one of the last ones, mm-hmm. and I think your maybe was the last talk, or maybe one more after yours. But I think it, it shows that politics and science are not far away from each other. Her journey into politics is on her terms. You obviously you're not in that road. You're not on that road, but it's still an exploration of science and its benefits. And I think your imagination is quite remarkable because I purchased three of your calendars. They're all photos you took 
but you designed the calendar in such a user-friendly way. I, I used it during the podcast. Okay. You know, I actually had it with me when I traveled. Mm. I had it on my desk, and a lot of the episodes, it kind of just shows up in the okay. corner. I was like, you know, this is not easy to do in a country that's collapsing. And to have some of these photos end up in NASA, this is not easy to do, and you, you did it. Another reason I'm here tonight is your uh, your your very uh, what's the word persuasive. Uh, I took my mom to the Cedars in Baru two weeks ago or so, maybe I, maybe longer. Um, you sort of noticed that I was there. You sent me a message on Facebook saying, "Look, كل ما بتطع دار الأمر لازم لازم تقول let's like say hello شي مرة." I'm like, you know what? Mm. Yes, he's okay. right. <laughs> so I did. Uh, you mentioned that you're able to stargaze here. Um, you have a telescope, and you're willing to spend some time with me to look up at the sky, and this is a real treat for me. Um, I'd like you to explain a bit about maybe, maybe the telescope we're going to look at and how you put it together, what you did to make this thing happen. I know briefly we spoke earlier that it's not something you just purchase and it ends up mm. in your observatory, your self-made observatory. You actually got all the pieces together and you assembled it. So could you take me maybe a bit down that path? Okay. And the effort needed to reach this stage, because I can't imagine this being easy. And there's a lot of discipline, maybe a lot of patience. So we could start with maybe why you have this type of telescope, how you put it together. Mm. And is this a trial and error experience yeah. that you're actually pick? I mean, mm. things maybe break okay. I, I, as much as you can say about, okay. about the equipment. I'm going to benefit of uh, the opportunity of this question to actually answer a question that you did not ask, which yes, is sir. actually what type of telescope should somebody buy? It's a question. It's a very common question mm. that uh, many people just like to start practicing this hobby. Yeah. Uh, there are different type of types of telescopes. I'm mm. not which I'm not going to dive into the details right now, but the easiest part, the best way is to proceed with the easiest and simple way because it's a, this hobby has a steep learning curve mm. Mm. and you've got you don't want to burn stages. You need to go through the difficulties and you need to make all the mistakes while climbing this ladder or this steep mm. curve yeah. for whether astrophotography or whether simply observational astronomy by just looking through the eyepiece of the telescope. Right. My recommendation is let's like start with a small telescope uh, that does not mm. require maintenance. Uh, do not look for trying something fancy and expensive. Even if you have the money, you're going to be easily demotivated at the beginning. So you can start with a small refractor and an eyepiece and uh, or several eyepieces and whenever practicing it for let's say six months or one year just you can start to upgrade so that's interesting money mm. is not a concern at the starting point. yeah money actually it can be a concern if mm. you have a lot of money because you're gonna be lured into going to the bigger wasting, telescopes yeah. and wasting your time and not ever even diving into the hobby because i'm going to interrupt mm. you only mm. with memory now when i was 19 i worked at the discovery channel store mm -hmm in the US, a shopping mall store, the Discovery Channel. They which the small refractors. Yes, yep. I used to sell mm. them, not knowing what I'm talking about. Mm. And it was this kind of lure, pay premium, and you're gonna be better off. But mm. I now thinking back, that made no sense. If you're starting, you want to actually build, you don't want to just stall. Yeah, sorry I interrupted mm. you, but that's a memory I yeah, have. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a major part about uh, the practicing astronomy, uh, let's say if you have a telescope, uh, sometimes you don't have all this uh, privilege that we have currently in this room, which has, we have light. Sometimes right. when you, it's like you always need to go into darker places. Even yeah. if you have the light, you will not be able to see everything there. Mm -hmm. So not being able to operate under cold conditions and during the night. Yeah. There are lots of aspects that can affect the hobby. So that's mm -hmm. why make it easy, adapt on the ease of usage of the mm -hmm. stuff and mm -hmm. start upgrading with time. So now porting this into the astrophotography and the using of the heavy equipment, let's say we call it the heavy artillery sometimes. <laughs> so uh, because also artillery is measured by the diameter of the of the ball uh -huh. or of the round, let's say. <laughs> so uh, and you've got lots those common uh, lots of common numbers like 155 millimeter or 120 millimeter. That's crazy. Like, so which is very similar to the telescope. We use eight inches with like 200 millimeter wow. 200 centimeter sorry 200 millimeter it's like those are kind of uh are you sure it's <laughs> a telescope up there or is it something else <laughs> Let's, we're gonna we're go gonna find out yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> so uh, and uh, so talking about this uh, astrophotography makes it become more complicated because mm. uh, most of the time you're gonna leave the telescope unattended and right. at the same time if you don't have a stable setup and the configuration is done right and there's a lot of IT stuff done on the computer in order to operate those equipment mm. it's a complex equipment just like the rocket but even with less let's say um, breaking points right, so a rocket right. can have around 300 breaking points or a, a small issue can make render all the system unoperatable it's like in telescope you've got around 10 or 20 that should be dealt with across one night that none of them should go wrong so right. that's one of them so the best and since you are doing operating an observatory the target is not to have it attended or you don't want to babysit this telescope across all night hey what do you oh, okay let's fix the screw you cannot do this every right. night yeah. or else you're gonna waste your time just fixing the telescope instead of using them mm. so there are lots of things that can be automated and each part that is automated can have its own problem so each time mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. to you add a solution this solution by itself has more complications than if it wasn't uh, right. this solution was not there so it's yeah. like you're adding a solution but adding three two or three complications at the same time does that does, does that require a team or are you able to handle this on your own uh yeah it's like uh, when you ec the equipment becomes stable and the configuration becomes stable it's like the concern stops becoming uh, an astronomy or it's an equipment problem it starts okay. becoming an it problem especially when you are operating the, everything remotely you've got you need the internet right, you've got the motor right. that is opening the telescope you yeah, sometimes yeah, you've yeah. got a weather station to know if it's raining just close yeah, the roof I, of course yeah and uh, <laughs> you've got the mount you've got the autofocus mm, i'm not mm. gonna dive into the details because most probably m not many people know about and it's, it's going to be a waste of time for everyone so about the boring stuff of telescopes and stuff so uh, but it's like at a later stage at the beginning i just had my table and the screen there and the chair just like fixing the telescope spending every night two to three hours under cold conditions just to I fix see. the telescope so now it's like i'm very proud that my observatory is headless when you talk about a computer that is headless it's like it does not have a screen so there's no screen right, right. there's no table there's mm -hmm. no chair mm -hmm. so it operates everything remotely and yeah. i rarely go there just to do some maintenance it's like i just push the start button before i sleep whenever i wake up when i wake up i just check if everything is fine and i just start my daily work so so you figured out a way to make it's like it's it now functions without you necessarily having to be yes, there all the time but it has undergone a lot of trial and error in some situation okay. because okay you've got the theoretical data sheet okay this thing does the thing but since you're getting all the equipment each from a different place and different mm. man manufacturer uh, nobody documents things about other manufacturers like you need to find out this right. bridge between all those equipment so what I what made me proud let's say and this observer it's like it's fully operational fully autonomous it works alone it's like it's like your child that is growing up it's yeah like now yeah. it goes to school and later on it goes to the university <laughs> it, funny. Yeah. you don't need to worry about how they're gonna come back and stuff so it's like they can do their homework yeah, on their own they can yeah. do with it. <laughs> exactly so <laughs> and sometimes we do projects together. It's like, I <laughs> this person is sick. This awesome. is <laughs> well, you're, you're co authoring something with your telescope. No, but this is a nice build up mm. to what we're about to see because mm. it, I, I got a sneak preview. Okay. Um, you know, when, I, when you showed me your telescope, the, the first few seconds, I was really trying to play it cool. Okay. I was really impressed. It's like a kid in a toy store. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what the hell is that? And the way you were very cool about it, just, you know, you had your little, it's not an iPad, it's something mm. like an iPad. Yeah. You're just, you're like, this is what it does. And it suddenly, it's mm. it's moving on its own. And it's, I, I was really, it's the kind of dream of, I think it's the kind of things I used to think about as a kid. And seeing it in, as an adult with a fellow adult, turning their dream into reality, priceless moment for me. So I think this is a nice segue to go and check out your telescope. Exactly. It's just, uh, just to close this, uh, this topic, uh, speaking of dreams and stuff, I also never imagined, like I always dreamt when I grow up, I'm gonna build my own or have my own observatory. But it's like during the COVID days, I said, well, you can do it now. Yeah. So it's like, I also, it's like, did not imagine that this dream can actually be true. And uh, so all I wanted to say that I also did not imagine <laughs> that as, at a certain point in time, I'm gonna have and operate my own telescope. You so. turned a pandemic and 
what hit us all in this crisis into an opportunity to fulfill a exactly. dream. And I'm really mm -hmm. inspired by this. Let's go upstairs. Yep. So I've never done this before. Mm -hmm. so obviously, the lighting is not ideal, but there's a reason for this. Exactly. This is a sensitive area. We're trying to not have anything even close to the telescope, so no cameras nearby. Mm -hmm. The laptop and microphones are hidden a bit. Mm -hmm. This is really just to get a better feel okay. for the telescope. So could you maybe describe what's going on in a very elementary way? Okay. So an idiot like me <laughs> could really admire what's going on. Okay, exactly. So that's, uh, I, I guess it's going to be... Uh, a very interesting session also about the gear. First of all, yes, there's something very special is happening today. So I rarely have this amount of light inside the observatory. It's like, uh, it rarely happens. It's like, it's always dark in here. Everything is dark around us, so. And I thank you for letting yeah. me even <laughs> bring, bring equipment closer to us. Yeah, it's a restricted area yeah. in general. So especially that uh, I have this uh, far from home, it's like it's very sensitive. So the smallest problem can require driving during in the middle of the night to right. reach this location. So that's why I rarely come in here. So th the good thing about that everything is autonomous, let's say. Uh, usually an astrophotography equipment, I'm going to describe the, them in a while. So if you came yesterday, you would have seen a spectrograph sitting in here, not, mm. not the mm. photography or the astrophotography tool. So the, the thing that we just discussed. So currently an astrophotography tool is mainly made out of a camera. In general, most astrophotographers use a monochromatic camera. So oh, let's say uh, we can always decompose the colors of we, we perceive in our eyes into red, green, and blue. This monochromatic camera is doing with the filters. So we right, have a filter right. wheel, just like a carousel of filters on here. We've got the camera. This one above it is a rotator. So to uh, remotely, uh, re it's just like when you are taking a photo with your camera, sometimes you just do the tilt. So this one makes it at, at 0 0.1 degrees. Mm. After we've got the autofocuser, the autofocus because telescopes do not have autofocus just like the mobile and the camera so it just adjust at micro adjustments in order to reach focus whenever right. temperature changes for example there are lots of things that can or whenever you change the filter so each one of them has a different focal point and the most important part in here is the telescope by itself this is a Ritchie Cratian telescope it's made of two mirrors in order to magnify just the example of the a magnifier glass but it's not glass it's made out of mirrors pure mirrors in here i don't have any glass in my setup except for the filters that filter in and filter out the required spectrum i also have in here a power management tool device that turns on and off everything remotely without the need of coming back to this place and this is what you showed me earlier where you're just in a different location mm -hmm. and you're able to operate this telescope yes exactly you don't have to be in lebanon you can yes. be anywhere yep. That's Definitely. that's quite nice. So mm. when you travel, you can still take imagery. Definitely, definitely, yeah. and it's oh. fully autonomous. And uh, we've got in here a certain cap that opens and closes to avoid dust and okay. lots of other yeah. things. And the most important equipment besides the telescope itself is the mount. This is the one that directs the telescope and makes it track the objects in the sky mm. in an accurate way. So mm. if tracking is not uh, done very well, you've got very bad images. So even if you've got the best telescope in the world and the bad mount. It's not going to work. Okay. So that's it. Uh, that's it uh, in a nutshell when it comes to the equipment. I'm going to make a small demo on how automatically everything starts at one. Yeah, hour. actually, you know what? So let me let me get the cameras a little, maybe a little closer. I, I guess this one is enough. This one yeah, is enough. all right, great. So let's, let's do it. Yeah. Just in one click, I'm going to press, just click it. So let's see what will happen. So I will say something before it moves. Mm -hmm. It is fantastic to see lights in the sky which is simply impossible mm. in Beirut. Yes, actually you can see the Milky Way from there. It's, it's that part of the south and that was the east when there's a big dipper by the way we just discussed in a while. Yes. That's there. <laughs> so, wow. well, but our eyes are not very well adapted because lots of light pollution yeah. here. So since we're just having this uh, discussion about the equipment we're going to see it in action. So after right. having programmed everything remotely, even from the computer, uh, we can, uh, from the internet actually, mm -hmm. we can just see in one push of a button how everything starts working and how it operates autonomously. So that's the one click. Let's see how things are going to change. Oh. So it's currently moving to one of the targets within the Cygnus constellation, within the east. So the first thing, the telescope moves. Now we're going to see the cap is going to open. 
Maroon, this is amazing. <laughs> so automatically, <laughs> that thing is going to open. As it's supposed to do, it's going to turn off also. Oh. Hey, Maroon, sorry, mm -hmm. you, you, you chose which constellation? It's one a target called um, uh, the, what do you call the, it's, uh, it's within the Cygnus constellation. Cygnus constellation. But it is a nebula within the Cygnus constellation. So you're able to do that by mm. just a click. Yep. You say you uh, tell it where you want mm. to so go, yeah. and now it's going to focus mm. on something we cannot see with the naked eye. And you figured out how to do this on your own. Yeah, which is, <laughs> yeah, it's like things, the astrophotography photography community, it's not, as, as, as big across the world, mm. it's largest. Mm. There are, it's an industry at the end of the day. Many yeah. people produce stuff, and we've got communities backing things up. But uh, but yeah, it's like uh, there are some complications that are not documented anywhere. So okay. those things after trial and error, and nobody has the same combination of setups. Right. Nobody has this the same anywhere in the world. But let me ask you, just mm. th when you're choosing mm. the target, how long does it take a telescope like this one to produce an image? Uh, that's a very interesting question. So first of all, I'm going to just tell you what's currently happening mm. right now. So at first, the telescope goes to the target. We call it, let's say it slews. But after slewing to the target, you need this micro adjustment to get the same frame that you were getting the night before and the night before, because sometimes you take several photos on several nights. So also, one target so could take several nights. So just like the Google Maps, yeah. it takes the stars as a reference in order to put the stars back at the same location that you were taking images from the last night. Right. So currently, we can see the autofocus currently working, doing the autofocus. Just that was like the noise of yeah, the autofocus. Exactly. So <laughs> it does several takes until finding the sweet spot, and it yeah. goes back to the sweet spot. So now we've just seen the telescope open, moving to the target. We've got the snap. Uh, we've got the autofocus happening, and in a while, the telescopes are going to silently start taking images. So okay. regarding the images you were just talking about, uh, sometimes there are some targets that we take around 30 to 40 to even hundreds of hours, and we definitely mm. cannot get this in one night. So we take them up to several nights. So what's happening is now the telescope is taking a very long exposure on the same target, mm. And for example, the, the exposure of our eyes is around 1 over 15 or 1 over 14, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the video we are recording is currently it's 1 over 29 frames per second. So, and here we're taking, instead of 1 over 30, we're taking 600. So it's 600 mm -hmm. multiplied by 30. So it's oh. like 10 minutes for every exposure. We've got one image. So, so and we keep collecting yeah. this one image of 10 minutes, 10 minutes across several nights, across, across several hours. And then at the end of the day, we apply some statistical analysis on them to reduce the noise and get the maximum dynamic range and details out of the, uh, the object we are taking images so of. That's a very naive question. Hmm? Is, does it have to be pitch black all the time for this to work? So, in, in other words, now we have this light here, mm. which is obviously not supposed to this be there. This is hazardous, by the way, yeah. Yeah, so we're, <laughs> again, thank you for letting me do this. But that kind of obstruction, mm -hmm. or even for that matter, let's say light in, in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. that's that's not supposed to be there. Okay. Does that ruin the, the imagery? Uh, it always ruins it. You can recover it by taking more images. And okay. sometimes we call it signal to noise ratio. Okay. So it depends. So sometimes, well, but sometimes, if you remember that example we have made in light pollution, comparing to uh, the noise pollution in a coffee shop. So there are some yeah. details that are below this um, this level of light pollution. That sorry, I'll just ask if you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. That is impossible to gather because it's already below the original noise. So it's impossible right, to recover right. this detail from the background light. So there's always some possibilities to improve, but uh, some stuff cannot. That's why, for example, you see most of the observatories are put in the dark skies and the deserts and the middle yes. of nowhere, right. out of reach of light and all the other stuff. But when it comes to amateur stuff, it's like, uh, and whenever you're not doing those multi-billion funded projects for course, astronomy, yeah. it's, it's not a big loss. Now, in, in Lebanon, mm -hmm. Del Amar is 
populated, obviously. So it's not the ideal place mm -hmm. for any telescope, but it's better than going further on the coast. Uh, is there a location in Lebanon that is best suited for what you're doing? We're getting into the most interesting stuff. So actually, we just started <laughs> talking about astronomy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that's not a problem. No, so but it's it's like I enjoy the most. Do you have a location that you go okay. to? There are several uh, aspects that would affect it. Just like we were just discussing at the ring, even what applies to small telescope, if this location is unreachable and you are unable to go there to do the maintenance, this million dollar telescope or 500,000 telescope, the big for us, it's not, it's not that costly, of course. <laughs> uh, well, you will not be able to use it. For example, mm. if it was a, on a mountain that is covered with seven meters of snow, you will right. not be able to reach there to do the maintenance or things are going to be hard. Right. So there's always a trade-off between the perfect location and the reachable location. So that's, that's mm. the first trade-off. Mm -hmm. The second trade-off, you've got the light pollution that we just discussed. Mm -hmm. But whenever telescopes become bigger, they start to become limited by the atmosphere. So it's like mm. the atmosphere, it's like you're looking through a, a piscine or what do you call it, piscine in English? A swimming pool? The, a swimming pool. It's like oh. whenever uh, the, the water is calm, you can see more. If somebody perturbates the water, you start seeing less. Oh, yes. And yeah, this yeah, is yeah. how the atmosphere of Earth, it's like lots of jets happening all the time. Sometimes oh. they are stable, sometimes they're not. But whenever you go higher, mm. the more you are reducing their effect. So, for example, if you're at 2,000, mm you've got less atmosphere between you and the, and the jets, or even sometimes, even if there was no jets, it just creates some blurriness. So it's better to be away from them? So like the, lower the altitude? higher you go, yeah. the less atmosphere thickness you've got, okay. and the less details you will be able to get. Well, that's interesting. I always thought the mm. higher the better. Yeah, the, the higher the better. Well, oh, it is the higher the better. The higher, oh, the, the higher yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Like you need to consider the Earth is like, it is a... Uh, Laimune or an orange, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the atmosphere is the sh uh, the right. shell of this orange. So, uh, so these NASA mm. telescopes that are in mm. the Andes, for example, in yeah, Chile, yeah, exactly. So that's the, the more ideal. you go higher, the yeah. more you've got less of this shell, and therefore right. you've got. But okay. that does not mean the higher is always better, because sometimes if you've got some a uh, geography that, for example, you've got lots of valleys, mm. so it's going to create lots of turbulence, and it's going to reduce the effectiveness of your telescope. Interesting. So okay. it's a it's another level of science when it comes to observational astronomy right. about uh, taking. Uh, the details mm. so mm. there's always that's why I always come back even if you had the perfect location you need to this trade-off in order to reach it and in Lebanon you've got those uh, winter for example winter conditions we also have uh, the lovely noise pollution yeah, forget exactly. light pollution <laughs> this is really fascinating mm. Maroon so in general mm. when you're when you're here and you're doing this I'm assuming you're looking at the imagery while leaving the observatory mm -hmm. so is that just a simple process of you come up here to make sure everything's working fine mm -hmm. but then you're more or less on your computer processing everything uh, yeah most of the time while the uh, telescope is operating i'm yeah. asleep you're asleep yeah <laughs> so this is hours and hours mm -hmm. yeah of hours and hours during okay. the nights and when the object gets totally collected and stuff after several days days yeah. or nights let's say i just gather the data analyze it if in case i require more data i just take more data and stuff for example okay. uh, i'm gonna for example uh, reverse back what we just said so So let's say, for example, we just started the telescope and well, now we're going to stop it. So this yeah. is what happens at every day in the morning at dawn. Automatically, the telescope comes back to its home. Wow. Ah, this is really and the roof is supposed to close automatically also. Right, but, right. Uh, but currently, it's on hold until uh, I fix it. So this is the telescope saying good night. Mm. It's good night for him, good morning to me. Good so. morning, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so now, it's just everything uh, came back to its original state. I know that you're very good at what you're doing because you make it seem very simple, although I can only imagine how long it took you to figure this out, and I appreciate your patience in explaining <laughs> this to me. Maroon, this is a treat. Um, we're going to shut this episode down and maybe yeah. take advantage of this more. Thank you for letting me into your observatory. <laughs> I know you told me you told me this in, before recording, yeah. and you mentioned it that this is not something you do. You gave me special privilege to see something beautiful. Uh, apologies for the video not being crystal clear, but this is really, I think, all you need to see is just how beautiful this telescope is. 
Um, keep doing what you're doing. I, I really appreciate and I, I look forward to seeing more of what you're doing and also these trips that you're taking, since they're related to this world, what, you're, what you have in store because uh, now you've got me curious about Marrakesh okay. and the desert and wh why you're going. I know it's for this as well. So let's do some stargazing and let's uh, stop recording. And yes. Thank you. Thank you for I your time. It. And it was an epic and thank you for having me part of your podcast and thanks for having me. I, I can now say that I finally made it to Maroon <laughs> Habib. Yes. A long political journey <laughs> to astronomy. Thank exactly. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening and watching, and a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.